Hey guys. Let's everyone look. It's the last episode. Can we just not for once? What is wrong with him? That's a classic demonic possession. Textbook example. I've seen it five or six times before, maybe once in Iowa. F I don't care if you're possessed. Get up. We gotta make a show. <laughs> <laughs> Can we not do this? It's a bad bit. I can't believe you couldn't tell. Aw, oh, man. Classic. It's been me this whole time. Hello. I have no idea who you are. Oh, that's Satan. What? We're acquainted. Gang gang. Gang gang. If you're Satan, then where is Aaron? I don't know. That's not my problem. I have no idea where I am. We made a deal. I tried to warn you. Actually, it's pretty important that I tell you something because I met God, we made a trade, his freedom for another. I've come to collect, and I want to your soul. If you still need a soul, what happened to Nick? Well, I took Nick originally, but I hate him. I don't want to go to hell! Hell can't be much worse than this place. You said so yourself. This is my hell and you are the devil. I got it. We'll play for it. Ugh, fine. What do you do around here for fun? We do movie reviews for the internet. That's pretty f***ing lame. I've been trying to tell him. Get out of here! But fine. You review a movie, and I review you. We do well, we stay. And if not... <laughs> I like it. Get to it. I'm gonna need one thing. Oh, not him. He's the worst. I know, but I need him. I was thinking you could add some more diversity to the panel, but it's your call. <laughs> well, Satan, on behalf of everyone here, I'd just like to say, Welcome to Stubtown. I'm one of your hosts, Brad Weber. As always, I'm joined by my friend Lil Scoochback. Scooch, Scooch, Aaron Flossen here. Uh, today we're reviewing uh, How to Train Your Dragon in the Hidden World. Yeah, uh, what did you think of it? I thought it was so good. It was, it's like, it's just, each, each and every one just got better and better and better. And I think, Legitimately, it rivals. I think I still think the Toy Story trilogy is better, but it rivals the Toy Story trilogy, as far as like just a complete arc of a character. It's great. It's so good. Now, what if I told you you were wrong? I would. That wouldn't be the first time. <laughs> so I, uh, I really appreciate the three movies, and like I'm, I totally love the idea of like three well-made animated movies coming out like five years apart, with mm -hmm. each of them telling a coherent full, complete work and like never really like giving up on their integrity or their artistic vision in mm -hmm. order to do that. But I felt that this thing was weaker than two and especially weaker than one. I don't know, like that's just me. Like there was, I don't know, it was certainly pretty and it was mm -hmm. well made. I'm not saying this is a bad movie. No. In any stretch of the imagination. I'd say it's even great in a lot of places, but I don't, think it's as good as it has been. All right, let's, I guess let's start from why I think it's good as far as animation is concerned. Okay, yeah, I mean, that, that's probably the standout yeah. thing in this, right? Uh, the animation in it is like, so typically I'm not huge on, on like the 3D animation. I'm more for stop motion or like the 2D hand-drawn stuff just because it's an oversaturated market. We have Illumination, we have Pixar, Disney's doing it now. And uh, Sony's DreamWorks. making Spider-Man. 
Well, I mean, that was a little different. That wasn't exactly the same kind sure. of 3D animation. Uh, so it's like just super oversaturated, but this really got me because the 3D animation just almost, it looked almost real. Mm -hmm. There's there's the water and the sand the and everything. The sand scene is ungodly. It, I don't know, that's a real video of sand. That was like, really okay, you're not, you're not saying ungodly in like a bad way. Yeah, it's no, like, no, that very, like, it's just like. That, that was a real video of sand, definitely. Mm -hmm. That's why I feel about like there's this, scene of a waterfall going and I'm almost positive they just shot a real life waterfall and it looked real. Yeah, this, this thing was like super, super pretty and like I went back and I was watching some stuff from the first How to Train Your Dragon and like mm -hmm. that stuff comparatively, well that movie's almost 10 years old now yeah. at this point, right? Like it does not hold up when you like go see this thing. It's still a really good looking movie but like this this movie is so beautiful, almost photorealistic. It's, I think, in the same time it's taken from like the first How to Train Your Dragon to now, I think this one will hold up a lot better. I don't know if, I, I really genuinely Visually? don't think you can get better than where the animation is now without it being just real. I mean like we, we everyone always says that. Like every yeah. time it's like, yeah. oh this can't look any better and it will. And then it will, yeah. And uh, also they, they got like, in most 3D animated movies, eyes just always kind of look a little off. Yeah. They got the eyes really well in this movie. I think they were able to capture how they, like, the, the human eye works and I, how much emotion just the eye can come like show. I've got real obsessed with eyes right there. <laughs> I think that's like super important because not only is this thing like 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 beautiful, but it's also like really well done as far as like animation as an art form is concerned. Mm -hmm. There are many scenes that just are devoid of dialogue completely and like totally let the imagery and the movements of the characters like speak for themselves. Yeah. I'm thinking of one scene, the scene with the sand yeah. is the one I'm thinking of. It's almost like a 10, 15 minute long sequence with literally no dialogue and it's funny, it's heartfelt, it's it's really well done. Yeah, there's, I mean, there's some movies that are just like, did this really need to be an animated movie? Mm -hmm. And I feel like this one like thrived on its on its animation and ne like needed to tell the story through an animated medium. Uh, there's also another scene that well, I mean we'll get to in spoilers and stuff like that, but like that's just full of like neon colors and everything, mm -hmm. and it just reminded me of something from like Avatar, the like the original 2009 Avatar. I haven't I haven't been blown away by visuals like in 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 an avatar way until this movie mm -hmm. like the visuals are are avatar level super good um i know like in a previous conversation before this this review uh you've you've said that that scene didn't really show too much new stuff to oh you. the scene you're talking about with that looks like avatar yeah yeah i mean like the it, bioluminescence scene. Yeah, the bioluminescence, yeah. right. Um, that, that scene was beautiful and much like the rest of this film, super colorful. Mm -hmm. Like this thing does photorealism, but it also is extremely colorful with like powerful like oranges on like sunsets and stuff. Like the mm -hmm. How to Train Your Dragon movies have always had really good sunsets because they're like set at ocean, like yeah. in the ocean, you know? And uh, I don't know, it, it was very pretty and colorful, but we only spent like five minutes in the whole runtime with that thing, so like, you know, it was like just it was like just enough for me. <laughs> just enough. Where's the where's the level of bioluminescence for Aaron to be happy? About here. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you want to talk about music now? Yeah. How to Train Your Dragon. The score is John Powell, right? Who's been he's composed all three of these movies. Um, the theme in particular is, is, in my opinion, one of like the most powerful like film, like recognizable film themes I've ever heard. I absolutely mm -hmm. love the thing. It's on it right now. But like Harry Potter, I don't know if you guys can hear them, these yeah. hecklers, <laughs> but it's like, like Harry Potter or Pirates of the Caribbean or Star Wars, you know, like 
or the Avengers or something, right? Mm -hmm. Nah, fuck the Avengers. <laughs> they have a recognizable theme. <laughs> they have a recognizable theme, but I, I really love the music in this thing, and I feel like the score wasn't as powerful as I remember it being. I didn't get enough of that theme. Mm -hmm. I go see How to Train Your Dragon movie specifically to hear that theme most of the time, just blasting on a big speaker sound system, and like that's a weird thing to say, but yeah, I didn't get enough of it. In the trailer, they had this... They did that thing that all movies do now where they have like a somber piano cover. Yeah. Of like a, but a somber piano cover of like the How to Train Your Dragon theme is like extremely my shit. Mm -hmm. And so like I was pretty disappointed that even that wasn't in the thing. So. I thought it's music just worked for the film. Yeah, I, it worked. I, didn't, I like, didn't think the score was as masterful as... as no, actually, I think it was just as masterful as like <laughs> the previous scores. I don't like. I've never been super mm -hmm. into the, the the How to Train Your Dragon scores, so that, I mean that's. I guess that's one thing about these movies that I don't think progressively got better. But yeah, as a whole, I think they did. I listened to the How to Train Your Dragon three score. I think I listened to it yesterday, mm -hmm. and you know, it was just sort of like waiting for the stuff I already knew from the other movies. And like the motifs from those other themes would come in, I'd be like, oh, here we are. And then it would just kind of go back to like sort of like middling, like whatever kind of mm -hmm. sound. Not saying this thing is whatever, it's a really fantastic score. So I don't know. I think this movie's good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, do you think it, it works as a like good? Do you think it works as a closing chapter for this, this complete arc? Or do you even think it's a complete arc? I think it's a 100% a complete arc. You don't make another one of these mm -hmm. at all. Ever. Yeah, no. Um, I guess we should probably get into spoilers. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I do think it's a complete arc because at the end, the dragons go away, they do a whole emotional thing, but I felt like this is, this is my major problem with the movie, is I felt like it was pretty poorly paced. Like, I felt like the whole time the movie was just kind of like, flirting with the idea of giving us that ending and you knew it was coming, but they just sort of like wandered around, meandered around the story and until it was time for the dragons to go away and time for you to cry. Like, uh, I mean, I thought the how we got to the very ending was a little rushed, but mm -hmm. I think the pacing worked, worked fine. Like we started with an intro to like where we are now in the like the coolest opening yeah, scene. Yeah, that opening ever. sequence is really when, fantastic. When uh, Hiccup just comes through and he's like covered in dragon scales and has a fire sword and like walks through yeah. Toothless's fire, which was gorgeous. Uh, These movies do fire really well, yeah. like unsurprisingly. But and like it starts with that, then we move to oh a new threat has kind of appeared, and then we move to like oh we need to move away from our home, which is another emotional like scene. And then we find a new home, and then we move to yeah. So I think it like, I think it just flows really well. Like it 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 starts here, and then you go here, and then here, and then here. I felt like so the first two How to Train Your Dragon movies. Um, I don't really remember How to Train Your Dragon two that well. I don't know why it just sort of like disappeared from my brain. I remember that That's really. Where they find the mom. Yeah, I remember that really great shot of her yeah. coming through the clouds like on the dragon with the mask on. Fantastic. Fantastic. So these movies have fantastic aesthetic too, like they totally nailed oh, that. Oh yeah. And um, that's beside the point. But I felt like the first two movies were really about like, they had a central theme of like family and like Hiccup is, is relation to his father is central to the first one. His relationship yeah. to his mother is the, second is, one. is the second one. But in this one, I couldn't really, obviously it's supposed to be about his relationship to Toothless. But Toothless- I mean, it's, it's a little bit that and it's also a little bit just his like, his relationship to himself almost. Yeah. Because it's it's him we've had, not being self sure. Yeah, we've had the we've had the the like father interaction. We've had the mother interaction. Now he's independent and True. on his own. That's that's very. But I think that's what really works for me is like this series I've I've grown up with. I was around Hiccup's age when yeah, the right. first one came out, and I was like, I knew what it was like to be like, like a kid, and then I knew what it was like to be like, that that almost angsty awkward teenager. And then I am now f trying to discover like my independence away from my family. So I think that's what right. super works for this film. Yeah, I just felt like there were some elements that didn't, I think that's like a really great point. And like, obviously I think that is what this thing is trying to get at, mm -hmm. like sort of being able to move on from your family or whatever. 
but like there's the there's the whole subplot with him and Astrid like getting married or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. and he's like, I don't want to get married or whatever. Well, he wants to get married. She didn't. But it just sort of didn't really go anywhere. And like the end of the movie, like the movie ends, and then they just get married. Like I don't feel like I got enough of like the conversation of like, oh, like that would have been really cool for this to be like a kids movie about like, oh, we aren't really ready for that yet. But they don't really touch on it aside from like one scene. And then like Toothless like having to go away, he's gone for a long time in the movie and he just like, I don't know, like you don't even get the, I'm pretty happy they didn't do the whole like, my best friend has a girlfriend now so we can't be friends. Like yeah. that's trite. But I just felt like that, there wasn't really a lot of conflict in Toothless leaving at all. Well, I mean it was like, so it's, it's you know, a lot of this movie is Hiccup and his relationship to himself. And he's, you know, throughout this entire series, thought he needed to rely so heavily on on Toothless mm -hmm. to be a person. And in this movie, he's letting, you know, Toothless go. He finally creates a rig for Toothless's, like, back wing or tail wing, wing tail. Uh, and Toothless just, like, goes. He just goes away. Uh, he, like, finally gave him, like, the, the dragon his, his freedom to go live his life. Yeah, I just, and then there's the whole subplot with Grimmel. Yeah, the villain. Who I think is a poorly, I don't think he's an effective villain. Like, I, I'd say that is like the weak spot of the movie for me, is like, yeah. is like this villain who's like sort of ineffective and not really intimidating, and it's another villain who can control dragons, which we've seen two other times in this franchise. Yeah. And I don't know, he's like, you're nothing without your dragon, right? And Toothless thinks he's nothing without his dragon until the very or end. And like, or the, it's Toothless. But Hiccup, ultimately, yeah. they need the dragons to beat the guy. Yeah. <laughs> like, I mean, it's the what he he like falls from the great height into the the water, right? Mm -hmm. Save him. Yeah. Save him. That's a great scene. Yeah, it's a uh, fantastic line. There's the. I mean. It, for, those of you who haven't seen it for some reason are watching spoilers. The the light fury, or the bright fury, the light fury goes and uh, saves Toothless instead of Hiccup at the end. Yeah, and um, I don't know. I just felt like that whole thing was like kind of rushed, and I, I wish that the villain wasn't in the thing, maybe even just so that we can spend more time with the interpersonal relationships. Like his mother, Hiccup's mother, is like barely in this thing she sidelined a little bit yeah which sucks because she's a fantastic character yeah and i don't know i just uh, wish we could have gotten more of those relationships in the closing chapter of this thing to make the ending a little bit more potent see that's I th that's why i think i'm okay with it because I, I just don't want to repeat myself over and over but like like i already got all the the stuff with the father and then they kind of bleed that in in the very beginning where he's like it flashes back and he's like a little kid and talking about his dad and talking about how this is their home stuff like that so i like that connected it enough for me to the first film the stuff with the mom connected it enough for me for the second film like i've already gotten those arcs i didn't really need to see them again mm -hmm. so that's true uh, that's not to say like this movie didn't have an emotional impact on me. Like yeah, no the 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 ending is a little bit rushed. I will give you that, but the epilogue is like so good. The epilogue is fantastic. Hip hiccup like when they crossfade from like I was like oh they like they bye bye Butterfreed yeah toothless or whatever, and then and then I'm like they didn't I didn't cry. I was like I came here to cry, and then they do a crossfade. I got pretty teary eyed in that. In that. I guess I just didn't have that much of a connection to the character. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, then they do this crossfade from like Hiccup to like Hiccup's children, mm -hmm. and like boom, that's when it hit me. Like, cause he has this like this beard, and I started crying, and I was like, I right at the beard, yeah. And I was like, I should grow a beard. No. Oh. It's a good looking beard. I'm gonna say it. It's a good looking beard. Oh no, like. Which, which will always bring me back to the animation in this film yeah. is flawless. I actually feel like the trailer showing the beard thing is like 
the worst thing that could have happened and set my expectations like in a weird way. Because you wanted more beard. I, I thought this was gonna be more of like hiccup growing up or something, right? And like that's not ultimately what this story is. No. It's a story that takes place a couple years after the first movie or the second movie. Mm -hmm. And it's like a day, right? Well, not a day, but you know what I mean. Yeah. A couple weeks. I don't know. I expected more from it. So I, I guess my expectations just weren't like, I didn't, I didn't see the beard and I didn't go like, oh man, I need more beard. Uh, I kind of just watched that How to Train Your Dragon movies to, to watch the relationship between how like the relationship between Toothless and Hiccup and how that mm -hmm. it, like keeps going. It's really the only reason I watch these movies and I think it did its job in that area. I don't know, it felt like a very personal film to me. I just think that things were a little all over the place and I would have liked a little more cohesion, a little more, uh, you know, a little more laser focus on some of these elements, I guess. Okay. Cut the villain and you can get like 20 minutes of this stuff. I like the villain. I liked, I liked, one, his like voice performance was- The performance was, was fantastic. very good. Who is it? Uh, F. Murray Abraham. He's, I, I, what would I know him from? Grand Budapest Hotel. Okay. Who's he playing? Grand Budapest Hotel. He plays the hotel owner. Okay, thank you. Like, he he gives it. Like, maybe even like a little too much at times, but I think it works. Or he's Jupiter in Isle of Dogs. You lost me. Amadeus. <laughs> yeah, also Amadeus. I guess that one's probably the big one. Uh, I like Wes Anderson movies. Yeah. Uh, I know. No, yeah, his. His performance was very good, and I I liked the I thought he was a very threatening villain, because I mean it wasn't like it wasn't like this whole thing where he just had like the ability to like control dragons and stuff like that. He like fully admits that he doesn't have the ability to control dragons. Mm -hmm. He just literally injects venom into their skulls and like doesn't care if they die. To me, that just seems like elements of like we're gonna make this guy bad, so you know he's bad. Like he he. He just seemed like he was evil for evil's sake, if that makes sense. Like, yeah, he doesn't like Night Furies, and so he kills them, and he wears this black cloak. Like, he didn't seem too complicated to me. There was I think that's what like what pushes. So I'm mean, like comparing it to like that Toy Story trilogy of okay. just like just a, almost a perfect animated trilogy, which they'll never make another one in. They shouldn't. <laughs> uh, but that that original Toy Story trilogy, and I think what sets it above the How to Train Your Dragon trilogy is they have villains that are like, like you, they're almost like the good guys and then boom, they reveal themselves as a villain. I mean, I guess except for Sid. He's yeah. always kind of bad wearing a black cloak. Uh, but yeah, so I think that's what really sets it apart was they like really flush their villains out. Mm -hmm. Uh, which I will, I will say that none of the How to Train Your Dragons no. movies really do that. Which it, is why I think this is actually just the best villain of the three, two. At least he has like a memorable performance. Exactly. I could not even describe the appearance of the villain from the second movie to you. I couldn't either. Is he big? He's a big boy? I know there's a big dragon. That's the first one. Well, there's, this, there's a big dragon in the second one too. I don't remember the second movie. <laughs> This, I mean, she like she comes up on a big dragon. Yeah, but that's the one she has in the... I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I think it works really well, and I'm happy to see that like DreamWorks has finally made like a good animated franchise. Like the how like the Kung Fu Panda movies are fine. I think they just get progressively like one Three's one was good. one was perfect. Two was like, and then three just kind of felt like an episode of TV. Maybe. I really like three, but uh, this is this is like one of the first animated like franchises movies even that like has never relied on the jokes. I actually think the jokes in this movie were bad. Like the worst part of the writing in this thing were like, oh my butt caught on fire. Like, <laughs> like that's what that's the level of these jokes. Uh, oh, he farted in the soup. Like, uh, there's like there is some of that, but the. The humor with with the one the twin sister. Oh yeah, and she's like locked in that cage. Hilarious. That's a pretty good scene. There was some good humor, but I'm I'm happy that this series has never relied on its humor and mm -hmm. it relies on its heart much more. Yeah. And I think that's what makes it a, a more like uh, 
memorable series of movies. Yeah. And I think the end one closes the closes the book perfectly. Speaking of closing books, that's gonna do it for us today. We're not a book. <laughs> Speak for yourself. So um, that's it for the term. That's it for this batch of episodes of Stubtown. Season two is done. I'm reluctant to call it a season, but <laughs> thank you for watching. And uh, until next time, goodbye from Stubtown. So, how'd we do? Awful. You're coming with me. What? Can you send me back to Japan? Aaron! Deal's a deal. Fine. Alrighty. Now, if you'll step with me to my portal to hell. That's just off screen. Where are we? On our way to hell. This is where I was when I came up with the idea to let Green Book win Best Picture. Why is everything so dark? You're dead, Brad. That makes sense. Something you should know. Each person's hell is made specifically for them. And I've been working on yours for a long time. That's something you hate to hear. Welcome to hell, Brad. Dry Kang! Oh shit, sorry Brad. Oh fuck. Oh hey Brad. Brad! Hey Brad. That's not even funny.